Welcome to the Worth Listening Podcast, where we focus on having positive and productive conversations around money. I'm your host, Lauren, a four-time Olympian and certified financial planner. On this show, my guests share their money stories. Everyone has a unique story and experiences both wins and losses when it comes to money. My intent is to give listeners something they can relate to, something that builds their courage to be open and take control of their own money story. When I'm not creating a great show for my listeners, I'm running my company, Worth Winning, where I help individuals and families organize their finances. Check us out at worth-winning.com. All right, now on with the show. I hope you all are enjoying the summertime months. We have officially entered into the summer days. I hope you all are having a good time. If you have children and they're out of school, you've got some activities planned and everybody is finding ways to be creative, be outdoors in light of the COVID craziness while still staying safe. We're going to end the Men and Money series with Ryan Skinner. Ryan is co-owner of Summit Financial Planners, a Massachusetts-based financial planning firm that works with clients that are over the age of 55. He wants to help them secure income for life. He's also the author of Taking Stock, Protect Your Wealth and Create Reliable Income for a Happy and Secure Retirement. Now, more than that, Ryan is living proof that you can survive a dark and downward spiral in life. I don't want to tell too much of his story and spill all the beans, but he went from riches to rags back to riches again. Because of his experiences, he's able to offer unique perspective on some of the struggles that he sees men facing. He's passionate about sharing his story with anyone who will listen. Today, he's going to share his story with us. You don't want to miss this episode. All right, Ryan, I'm so excited to have you on the show today. I just told everyone a little bit about what you're up to now, but every story has its own wonderful introduction. So why don't we start by you just telling us a little bit about how it all got started for you. Where are you from? What was it like growing up, et cetera? All right. I grew up just outside of Boston, Massachusetts. I grew up in a lower middle class family. My mom was a housekeeper by day, cleaned offices at night. My dad always had two jobs. So they were hardworking people, good, honest people. My grandparents were all, well, one was from Indiana, but he was a farm boy. They were all real hardworking, salty, good people. That's one thing I learned growing up is like how work, how important that is. And so I was a hard worker. Um, in school, I was a terrible student. I learned disabilities. And as a result, grades one through five, I got picked on a lot because I couldn't read. I just like see air, read, comprehension. Back then, they thought, just thought you were stupid. Going to sixth grade, my mother said, hey, what if we put you in, Catholic school with your cousins. Maybe he said to my dad, what if he doesn't get picked on? If he doesn't get picked on, maybe he won't act out. And it's true. I went to Catholic school. Kids didn't pick on me, so I actually enjoyed going, which was really a nice experience. But I still was a terrible student. I never really got much better at that. So that led to me just still being a bad student, but at least I was happy where I was, if that makes sense at all. So seventh grade, my life changed forever. I had a teacher who noticed that although I couldn't read to save my life, I was gifted with always giving me and I value being in that school because my parents put me there. I got a job. Some of a family friend owned the uh, breakfast place. So I washed dishes Saturday and Sunday, 5 a.m. to 3 p.m. Each week, I gave my dad the money. That's how we paid tuition because they didn't have the money to it. So they didn't care. So seventh grade, this teacher noticed I was really good numbers. She was a Catholic school teacher. So she was not going to get a social security. So she kept reading book after book on how she could save, build her own social security, create her own pension income. One book said if you could draw with a crayon, you could buy it. She got, oh my God, he's good with key draw the crayon. He's great with numbers. She wanted to build my confidence. So she taught me about the stock market. So she taught me this technique, buy what you know. So I bought Chrysler, not because they made cars, but because they had people buy so many of their parts for beers. I bought Nike, Coca-Cola, Gatorade, anything Michael Jordan went near because he was a legend even back then. <laughs> and I did pretty well. I beat the market that year. So my teacher wrote a letter to the author of this book just so often he was going to stop promoting his own books and stuff like that. It was Peter Lynch. He came out and met with me. I got some features. Eighth grade, I was in Women's World Magazine, a whiskey to Wall Street. So by that age, I knew what I was going to do. And my dad said, Ryan, this will change your life. And he was right. Going to high school, God works for people. I go to high school. The vice principal goes, it happens to be a retired stockbroker. He got custody of his son, put his kid in school there. So he wanted to be present for his kid. So I'm in the hallway as a freshman. He says, you, whiz kid, my office now. He had this big, thick Boston accent like New York. <laughs> 
I go into his office and I'm like, what are you doing as a vice principal? I go, it doesn't make sense. You're wearing a $2,000 suit. You look like at the nines. You're a Catholic school vice principal making like 30 grand. He explained he was there to help his kid out. He said, here's the thing, kid. You might be embarrassed by what you know. He said, but I grew up five kids sleeping in a bed in Worcester, Mass. We were so poor. I played backup quarterback on the New York Jets for two years. And he said, and then I went into financial services. He said, I do well enough to provide for my family. provide well. So that's why I can do this for myself. So right there, he mentored him every Friday before school. We meet him. I go to college, right? On a full scholarship to Merrimack for finance. Schools wanted me because I had some press around me. Well, let's pause for just one second. So before we get to college, let's go back to childhood a little bit here. So first thing is you come from two, like you said, really hardworking parents. Did you have siblings in the household as well? I had a younger sister, two years younger to the actual day. Same birthday, two years younger. Oh, wow. That is really cool. What's so different? I'm 6'1", 220 pounds, dark skin, dark eyes, dark everything. She's 5'1", 100 pounds, blonde hair, blue eyes. <laughs> and we could be different. <laughs> work ethic. Everything about us is different. Huh. <laughs> That's super cool. So with you and your sister, I guess maybe to go back to your parents, you said they both had multiple jobs. So very much a working class family. Can you talk a little bit about the conversations that you had in the household about money or the messages that you heard or the experiences you had via what your parents were bringing in versus what was going out and what you remember about that? Yeah, it's funny. So uh, I asked my mother once, I said, Mom, let me ask you a question. How is it that Uncle So-and-so is a superintendent in this newspaper? Auntie So-and-so has a master's degree. They don't own homes. You're a housekeeper, Ma. You scrub towards for a living. How is it you have a house? My mother taught me a lesson that I still use with my clients today. Nobody had more of an influence on me than my own mother. She was solid. She's strong. Every good quality I have came from her. I got to be honest. My mother said to me, she called me, she still calls me Ted. I used to have a teddy bear as a kid. So she goes, hey, Ted, it's not what you have. It's what you do with what you have. Or do you got to get that? It's a matter of what you have. I mean, in my 20s, I was making big time money and I was spending bigger money. I ran out. Yeah, I love that. It's not what you have. It's what you do with what you have. So despite not being big earners, they were responsible with what they had. So smart, so smart. And you know, my parents have their dream retirement right now. They inherited a little, when my grandparents both died both sides, their houses went up in value, obviously, over the years. So my parents had a few inheritances, which I helped protect my parents and my aunt and uncle. My grandparents let me guide them. But my mother and father, they were retired because my mother could stretch a dollar a mile and all of that, but they find happiness in small things. They don't need the BS. Yeah. And keeping life really simple. I can appreciate that as well. One of the other things you mentioned was that you would work, I think, every Saturday from 5 a.m. to 3 p.m., you said? Saturday and Sunday. Yep. Both Saturday and Sunday. And what age was that? That was seventh grade that you got your first job then? No, it was sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. It started when I went to sixth grade when I went to Catholic school. Gotcha. Okay. So from age 12 or 11 or 12 years old, you had a job, you were working and not only were you working, but you were working for a specific purpose to be able to pay for your own education at that time. Yeah, I mean, and my parents also probably need a little extra money too on, the, on top of it. Because, I mean, the education cost 800 bucks back then. And I was making 75 bucks a day. They had two kids. They didn't have much money. Even in college, I was always big on, you know, you work, you give your parents money, they do what they need to. No, I love that. I, I had to circle back to those two things because I think it's such an important thing. One, to set the scene, but also to, you know, paint the picture of how people become successful. Working from a really young age is something that, like you said, is ingrained and has probably shaped who you are. Okay. So you were at college now. Tell me one, did you have to finance college? What was the kind of conversations around getting ready for college? What were the circumstances under which you decided that? I went to that Catholic high school and my grades, like I was a C student, maybe C minus, C plus, maybe a B here and there. But what happened was, because I was so gifted with the financial, I was traded stock in seventh and eighth grade. I was on TV at one point. So as a result, finance schools wanted me there because I was gifted at it. They knew what I was going to go on to do, hopefully, some decent-sized things. Very rarely do people without an Ivy League education crack into an industry like mine and really get to take off. But for me, and I'll explain it later on, but it's all gone. Anyways, I got a couple of scholarship offers, partial, partial. You know, it's also a really good basketball player. So Merrimack College, which is just two schools, you know, we'll give you a scholarship, mainly academic because of your financial planning ability and stuff. But, you know, we'll put a little uh, basketball in there maybe. However, I was supposed to play midway through the first year, I blew up my knee. Coach said, you know, Ryan, you, you, you get mostly academic, just keep the scholarship. So I didn't have to pay for college, I'll be honest. But I didn't go where I wanted to either. These kids today, they're all complaining that they have to pay off their loans. I believe everybody should get an education, but you should be able to go to like Ivy League school and not pay. You know what I mean? So I didn't have college loans. I did have say it's funny my parents we went camping as a kid and my father finally saved up enough 
to buy this trailer. It was like a 20 foot trailer with like a little pub up bathroom in there. So it was his dream. He loved camping. It's funny. My senior year of high school, he decided he didn't want to camp anymore. So I'm just done. I'm done. I don't want to do it anymore. He said, why do you want to do it? Why do you want to do it? My college scholarship covered my um, academics, but it didn't cover room and board. And my parent, my dad wanted me to be able to live there. So he sold his trailer to pay for my first year of room and board. And I didn't know it at the time. I found out years later. So for his birthday next year, I'm buying a lake house for him to make up for it. Wow. Oh my goodness. That is amazing. So from camper to lake house, uh, your dad's really, really lucky. But that's the thing. They did that. He wouldn't even tell me he did it. Like I had no idea what he was doing. And the amazing thing was like my parents would do anything. Because my mom, when I was on school vacation, I'd have to go over to the house and she was cleaning. I'd say, Ma, you know, why are you doing this? She'd say, Ryan, I'll scrub countless toilets to give you a better way of life. And she did. My mother sacrificed I never knew somebody who worked as hard as my mother. That's what I tried to do. So it sounds like you had a pretty awesome upbringing. You had two parents that loved you. You were able to get some work, get private school education. You went to college. Despite blowing out your knee, you were still able to get a free college education. Sounds like you're like riding high on the hog. And we know you're running a successful financial company now, but there had to be some bumps in the road along the way. So tell us a little bit about where kind of poop hit the fan for you. Everybody hit the bump at some point, right? Is that to say? So my biggest bump, well, as a kid, I had um, somebody close to me I'm dead who was abusive to me. So that was very hot. So that gave me a lot of anxiety to young child. I always had anxiety. My way of working through it was sports and uh, basically just going all out, watching the markets, do whatever it took. So that was one bump. And then uh, when I got to college, here's what happens. Um, I was in college and I was going to drop out because although I had a full ride, I still had to make money. My father got laid off. I was in the locker room at the gym saying, oh, I'm going to college. I'm going to this crap. Happened to be a guy in there who recognized me from some of my past and said, kid, you're really gifted at finance. I said, yeah, but I don't need a college degree to be a financial advisor. He said, money moves. Here's my business card. It's a big, chubby, naked guy. He says, call me tomorrow. We'll talk. Sure enough, he was the head of Putnam Investments area. They had an office, a branch right near my college. So he said, I'm going to create it so that you can work 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. And you go to school in the evenings, you'll finish your college in four years, like your father wants you to do. You're the first one in your family to get. So I did that. And God always works with people. A bunch of people in my department were going to LA to this big business thing for our company. And I was supposed to go. But some of the people that were older, been there longer, although I was senior to them, I got more promotions, they would complain. They said, listen, this is nepotism. Ryan's only been here two years. And he's, you know, he's a good guy, but he's only been here. I've been here eight years. So they fought me. And they fought with the company. So a guy who brought me in, Jack, says, Rye, I can't sing out to LA. They're going to smoke. He said, please step out. Said, okay, I won't go on this. You take it. I was really resentful. Wouldn't you know one of those planes went to the Trade Center? It was 9-11. And I can't believe it. Three months before, they canceled me on that flight. So it was always like weird things happened. So I'm in college. And I'm getting out of college. I start hanging out with this kid who was like a second cousin. I looked up to him. He was, uh, I don't want to say certain things, but he was involved in a certain kind of crime, a life crime, that sort of business. And I was an insecure kid my whole life. I honestly was. If you told me to be this, I'd be that. So I started emulating these guys. I was going out with these guys, hanging out like a tough guy, fighting people. I was in a fighter. And they said, who I had hand surgery. I broke my hand. So I had to have hand surgery. They gave me Percocet. And I'll never forget. I never took it for the pain because I could take pain. But I took it every weekend. Me and a buddy of mine. I had 16. I can still remember the count. I had 16 pills. Every Friday and Saturday, each of us would take one pill each night. And so it lasted us like, what, four or eight weeks, whatever it was. And I remember thinking, wow, a couple of years later, I have another surgery. I get perks again. And now I was a really insecure kid. And I was so shy, so awkward. And I've been in the financial world for about two years right now. My practice was doing okay, but I was still always nervous of the future, the unknown. And I was nervous about meeting girls. Like, even in high school, I only went to prom with whoever asked me. I was so shy. I used to say I was surface friendly. I'd pretend like I was okay, but really I was just awkward and shy. When I found perks at the next set of surgery I had, it was like lights out. Like, here's a solution. Drugs weren't a problem for me. They were a solution. I felt smarter, better looking. I made more money because I had more confidence. I had faster cars, faster girls. You know, I was living a fast life. When the script ran out, I just started doing what all guys would have money. I started buying some of the street here and there. It was just perfect. Said, though, things were getting better business wise. My outside, everybody thought things where I was living a good life. It was good. Then at one point, I had had a surgery where I actually bled out. And when I bled out, now, at this point, I had a business like seven or eight years, very well established. I was making well into the six figures, and I had very low expenses, but I was so empty inside. Like, I would fly friends everywhere. I'd say, oh, let's go to Miami. I'd pay for people to go. I would pay for friends. And I remember calling my dad from a bathroom floor in Miami, crying, saying, Dad, 
I'm so lonely. He's like, Ryan, why are you going to hang out with your friends in the pot? And that's where my life went. So I wasn't a kid who did drugs in high school and college because that wasn't my thing. My uncle that I had issues with, he was an alcoholic. So I always thought drugs and alcohol, alcoholics are addicts, they're bad. So fast forward, I get out of that surgery, I come out of the coma. I go back 30 days later, you know, tell them, hey, I'm feeling better. They said, Mr. Skinner, we found some tumors in the outside and stomach. They didn't grow very fast because the blood flow is more than the inside, but we have to get them out. I said, okay, am I going to die? They said, no. They said, we're going to put you on oxycodone. Now, I'm going to tell you, I had watched my friends, those tough guys, quote unquote, I had watched them take a Rolex off a guy's wrist for one pill because the guy's so dope. I knew what oxycodone did to people. I was not a big, I was a volunteer. That's what did it. I was, and I'm, like, ah, I'm different now. I'm 26, 27. Nobody comes an addict at 27. It doesn't happen. And I would talk about how tough I was and this and that. Next thing you know, fast forward, they have the other pills. They give you six oxycodone a day. And then before you know, I go back and say, oh, you're all better. This is good. We're going to wean you off the pills. They wean me off over like five weeks. I mean, I went from taking 480 milligrams a day and they're trying to get me off. Well, what happened was I had some money. So I started buying them from people I knew and buying them on the street. Before you know it, I had a scream and have it. I was dropping, you know, crazy on money out. I don't remember exactly how much I spent on but I'll tell you, before I had that surgery, I had about 800000 between four and case bank accounts, three cars, two houses. After that surgery, within, I don't know, within two years, I didn't have any houses, any cars, not a penny. I'm um, living on the streets, shooting heroin, with toilet water. It was over. So you said you started with prescription pills, but this went beyond prescription pills. It sounds like you really hit rock bottom. And we hear a lot of stories of people that are very financially successful that, like I said, hit some sort of bump in the road. I was an intravenous drug dealer. Like, you all heard the boy, one of the top financial professionals to the bottom. Okay, so you've gone from being very successful, like you said, earning, saving well, doing all these different sort of things to literally you're homeless now. Can you walk us through some of the things you've experienced and some of the situations that bring men to being homeless? This month is all about men and money, and we know that homelessness among men is much higher than it is among women. And what was that time like? Can you just pause there? For a lot of men, at least myself, money was a way to mask my insecurities. If it wasn't drugs, it was money. I could flash money. I could get girls with money. I could do whatever I want because I had money. I could manipulate situations. I did a thing on my podcast the other day with some client that said, money does make if you're greedy, if you're selfish, if you're insecure, if you're arrogant, it'll make you that. If you're generous, if you're thoughtful, if you're kind, it gives you opportunity to pay it forward and bless up, it'll make you that. And when I was in my 20s, I wasn't a bad kid. I would do anything for anyone. I had this identity thing where if you asked me who I was, I would hate my business guy because I didn't know who I was. All I knew was, hey, I made money. This is me. At the bottom, I was too insecure to ask for help. Mm-hmm. Money also made me so I didn't have to ask for help. I'd say, oh, I don't need help. You know, everyone knew something was going on, but when you're still making money, paying your bills, people think you can't be that bad. Money almost killed me because I was up there so long. What was beautiful was when I was at the bottom, right? A friend of mine's probation at Portos. When I was at the bottom, I was on probation. And I violated probation. Very serious. Violation. So I had to go to the courthouse for a hearing. And I walk in. And I look at my friend, Benny. And he's the chief. And I said, you're not going to screw me, are you? He goes, screw you, Ryan. He goes, you screw me. He goes, I let you out there. I didn't have you sent to jail. And all you do is violate things, make me look like a fool. And say, he goes, yeah, you're going. So I went to jail. At one point. There's somebody in the eye of this guy. So the jail around here, it's strange because I grew up with people from all different backgrounds. The jail's very segregated. I actually was able to connect with all the people. I just didn't care about the, what these people mean. So I was very fortunate because some guy from a different background, from a different lifestyle, I went up to him and I said, you got peace. What is it that you're doing? I admired this guy. Now, here I am poor. I had nothing left. And this guy's in jail. So, you know, and he said, you know what, son? He's done a lot of jail time. He said, give me an easy prayer to God. I said, listen, I was raised Catholic. Where's God now? Where was he when I was abused? Where was he when I was poor? Where was he when I was Because I'm not asking for the stuff you did to yourself. You know what I mean? just ask for help, for power. So I did it with him. He said, let's go on and pray. And he got me to what to do. And I went down. And then after that, every day I did it for the first five, six years, nothing happened. I'm going to tell you, this was almost a waste of time. But I had nothing else to do. By day seven, the thought of doing drugs left my mind. By the two weeks later, the guy who I would, my probation officer, who I wanted to kill if I ever got out. I was now praying for it. Within a month, that guy was like, I was like, you know, I wish him well. I went back to court. So when I was there, I said, Your Honor, this is one of those God shot moments. I said, if you let me out, I'm going to use drugs. And I might die and go back to jail. I'd rather you hold me in a cage and get me some sort of treatment. And she said, all right, I'll do that. And I said, well, I'll tell you what, you do that. And I promise you on my life, I'll be back here paying it forward and being a service. 
said, Mr. Skinner, I hope so. She hit the gavel. So I went. They got me treatment after. I went back for my last court case. Okay. And the, the one that was still hit about that guy's fighting. The probation officer who I hated, the one who worked for my friend Benny, the guy was so mean to me all the time. I thought, he went to the judge and said, listen, if you convict him of this, he can never go back to his job again. It's too serious of a crime. He said, so if we can let this go, he said, give him more probation. Let's see how he's doing. He's doing well. Through the grace of God, I managed to go do, I don't know what it was. I managed to just get through it all. I couldn't even tell you how it all worked out. Next thing I know, I took guidance from people. I was coachable. I wasn't smug. I, my, my ego was gone because I had lost money. I lost everything. So I was finally stripped to the core. And that's what's made me so successful in my business is I was able to get to the core of myself because I had no choice. I had no money. I had no clothes. I had no food. I had no anything. And as a result, I had to really get down to like who I was and how I was. I had to refine myself and rebuild myself. Yeah, you had to really start from the beginning and build from the ground up to kind of appreciate what all that you had accomplished prior to that. And it wasn't even about appreciating. It was just not to start. Like it wasn't that I went, it wasn't that I went off and did anything monumental. Okay. It wasn't like I said, I'm going to become a businessman. No, I just said, God, please let me eat. Let me not be an embarrassment to my parents. Like that was a really important thing. That's where it's key. I, I was able to, at that point, say, you know, and I just kept getting give guidance from people, one person after another. And next thing I know, things got a little better. And then I got a little healthier. Then things got better. And then I got healthier. And then my sponsor from, from the program, gave me my first client and this lady came on board. Let's pause there for one second and talk about the experience in prison. So you were there and you had a specific experience and I was looking at some stats and it says that according to the numbers of the Federal Bureau of Prisons of 185,000 people that are in prison right now, only 6.8% are women. So why do you think that men are incarcerated at a higher rate than women? What pressures are men facing that are leading to these statistics? Why are the numbers so much higher? What did you experience while you were there that might, might answer that? Well, I think uh, for most men, I know a lot of gangbangs. So I went, I run a program now at the jail, and I'll tell you why, from my opinion. There's a lot of pressure. I hate sounding sexist because it's not the truth, but in men's mind, you're supposed to provide for your family. Okay. For example, I wouldn't get in relations when I got out of jail until I knew I was making enough money that I could pay for kids. I mean, I literally wouldn't even have a kid so I knew I had enough money to pay for the college. It's so much fear and it's based on insecurity. It's based on our fake values. God willing, we're going to have a whole overthrow of values and really get our value system right. Men should have to feel like, hey, it's my job to do this, my job to do that. Like, it's a team. But I'll tell you, even in my family right now, my wife and I, she's a nurse. She's capable of making, but I feel the pressure on me. Like, I'm supposed to. Ah, yeah, I think that's a really good point. The pressures that men face to be the provider, to be the strong one, to hide their insecurities, to not be soft are sometimes leading them to do things that are maybe survival of the fittest or like you said, cave under pressure. And that's maybe why there are more men incarcerated than women. Thanks for sharing perspective on that. OK, so I, I want to get back to what you were saying, because we know that incarceration impacts your ability to earn after prison. But it sounds like you were able to get back to earning and sounds like you got an alley-oop, if you will, with not being convicted so that you did not have that stop you from being able to go back to your previous job. Just so you know, I did have 13 other convictions. So believe me, it wasn't like I got like a clean record. I could never get a job anywhere else. Luckily, I've driven it up to sell my own business. But the one thing that would have like really precluded me is certain things in any industry. That's like a no-go forever. But yeah, so I got that, that kind of one was a nice little pass. But it was kind of doing the right thing. Good things happen to people who are doing the right thing. I always tell, because I mentor, I run the program at the jail, and, and I do a lot of mentoring with men. And I say, you know what, how, how successful people do, they work hard. When things are hard, like the last coronavirus, my industry, and I came up against some other adversity because people judge you. Like people from the state judge me real bad. Like, because it, it's their old school, and they've been in business in this job 50 years. And before that, I was a cousin. Like, State officials in Massachusetts are all connected. Their family, if you have generation, generation. It's a very connected system. People judge me, but with God in my corner, I overcome all these things. When I got out of jail, I read a book called The Power of Positive Thinking by Norman Vincent Peale. That book, a friend of mine recommended, talked about bringing God as your business partner. I said, boom, there it is. So I used to read it at a beach. Like I'd drive an hour to the beach, read for an hour, drive home. Driving down a hill and I look up at the sign and it says Summit Ave. And you go, boom, Summit Financial Partners. That's the new business name. That's how it was named. Wow. So cool. So you were able to go from 
doing awesome to rock bottom to get back to my ability to earn. I get back to my, not just my ability to earn, but to starting my own thing. So all these different things have kind of come full circle for you. So who are you serving at Summit Financial Planning now? So it's Summit Financial Partners. What we do is I do retirement planning. So when people are near retirement or retired, they come see me and I help them to protect their nest egg. So when the market's going down, they don't lose. And I help them to create secure income and make sure that everything's set up so they get income as long as they live. If they pass, the money goes where they want it to. So we serve anybody over the age of 55. Honestly, it's people I connect with. I want to deal with nice people. I've actually turned away a few wealthy people the last week or two because, frankly, they were just cranky as hell. And one guy barked at my admin, my office desk person, and I was like, you can't talk to her that way. You know what I mean? People can be snippy because they have money. So we serve people in the area of Massachusetts. We have people now in Florida. We just took on a lady in Hawaii because now with the whole power of Zoom, you can kind of do anyone. But our job is to help anybody who's near retirement or retired to protect their nest egg and build secure income for life. I love it. I love it. I love it. This has been such a wonderful story of all the different things that somebody can accomplish. Or what would you say to a gentleman that is listening today and is feeling lonely, is feeling insecure, is feeling some of those things that you mentioned that are the pressures that men face? What do you say to them right now? Get a process. I built a process out for myself and I use it with all my, I run that program at jail every Friday. I run a program for inmates and it's all about the process. For example, getting up, make yourself get up early because successful people get up early. Say affirmations, pray. Even if you don't know what you're praying to, pray. Throughout the day, in a meditation, create things in your day. I have probably five or six things throughout the day I do. I do a gratitude list every morning. And, you know, if you're not grateful for breathing, for having a bed to sleep, for having a pillow, even if you're having a bench, you're almost a great people have the bench. I'm grateful I didn't get beat up that night. Whatever it is, if you were set to a gratitude list, you'd be surprised. You know, like attracts like. If there's anyone out there who ever needs anything, reach out to me. I'll send them a copy of my book free. They can kind of hear my story and like where it sat and where it landed. More importantly, I would take a call with them. And if, if, if I can, if they're local, I'll mute them. If they're not, I'll do a Zoom meeting. Three months ago, I had somebody reached out to so you struggling. Uh, his story sounded so, kind of similar. So I flew down to meet him for lunch. I, uh, I will do anything for anyone in that spot because men have a lot more pressure than people think. There's a lot more insecurities. And, it's, and it's, you're not supposed to be insecure. I was supposed to say, hey, I'm insecure. I'm hurt. But you know what? We are. Yeah. Thank you so much for sharing all of this story. So we are now in what I like to call the final sprint. I'm going to ask you a few rapid fire questions and you just give me the answer. Are you ready? Shoot. Sure. All right. You've got $20 in your pocket right now. What do you spend it on? Donate half, buy myself a bunch of All right. I like it. Food too. <laughs> got to feed our bellies. Got to eat. I'm always eating. Finish this sentence. That awkward financial moment when? When you have to tell a client that they don't have enough to retire the way they want to retire. They either have to change their lifestyle or they have to work long. Uh-oh, that is an awkward financial moment. <laughs> you have no idea. <laughs> what is your worst money habit? I don't do a lot for myself. I, I'll do anything for my wife, my kids, uh, but I don't do anything for myself. I mean, I, you know, I have everything I need, so I don't buy myself anything. Self-care is important. Best advice you've ever received? Just be kind. The only thing I tell my daughter, I said, I don't care if you get an A in school or D in school. She got an award last year. Just be kind. I love it. Just be kind. Because everybody's hurt. Treat everyone like they're hurting because somebody is. Simple and straight to the point. All right. Last but not least, could you share with us one thing that you would like to prove about your personal finances in the upcoming year? I'd like to buy a rental property. It'd be really important to me. as secure outside income. So it's not just always on me to make money. I love it. What is the action item that's going to help you reach that goal? Work my ass off, save, and then wait for the market to soften. <laughs> All right. We have made it to the finish line. You are now standing on the podium. You know, I'm a, a Olympian, so I, I like people to stand on the podium. When they are you really? And yes, yes. Um, Holy shit. Jeez, now I feel awkward. <laughs> <laughs> See, but, now I feel insecure. <laughs> <laughs> No need at all. So you are standing on the podium. This is your time to shine. I want you to tell us all the things you're up to, all the ways we can support you. This is your time to let the community know where we can find you, whatever you want to say. All right. So my website's ryantakingstock.com. Okay. It's about like my past and what it goes on. Uh, in terms of supporting me, you know, anybody that's near retirement or retired, you send them our way, we'll help them try to protect their nest egg. And we do, I always do a far lower fees than anyone else because I believe that to whom much is given, much is expected. And most importantly, uh, 
I run that program for the jail. Every day we're in the process to try to get them more treatment when they get out, more transition. Those people, those are somebody's kids, somebody's brother, somebody's sister. More importantly, if you don't like them, they're coming back to your community when they get out. So let's treat them like people and get them healthy. I love it. Ryan, thanks so much for being on the show today. You shared so much knowledge and so many gems. And I know that men and money is a better topic because we had you on the show. I hope you enjoyed listening to Ryan's Money Memoir. I love the honesty and transparency with which he shares his story. I think he offered us a really interesting perspective on the impact that insecurity can have on people and how he was using money to mask his struggle. Money can give people access to good things, but it's also all about how we use it. Ryan went from what most would define as successful to wasting everything he had to feed a drug addiction. But he's a great example of the ability we all have to pull ourselves up and out of any hole that we might be in. So analysis paralysis is no longer a thing after hearing this story. Let's get moving. Let's change the trajectory of our lives because we know that money is definitely not going to buy us happiness, but we can use it as a tool and we can align our spending with our priorities to help us reach our goals. If you want to learn more about creating a financial plan for yourself, check out worth-winning.com. Thanks for tuning in today. We hope you found this episode worth listening to.